Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I do want to encourage you to pick up your copy of All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet. It's my latest ebook. It's available for the Kindle, the Nook, and in the iBookstore. In it, I examine life lessons from seven great detectives of radio, television, and literature. And it will probe such questions as... Is Joe Friday a nice man? What can Cannon teach us about dealing with frailty in others? And much more. The book is also available at store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. The original air date, August the 27th, 1949. And the title is The Eager Witness. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This started with a man on trial for his life and an A1 citizen eager to testify. But there it was interrupted. And it wasn't until I found a corpse in a bubbling bath, gunplay in the woods, and lots of blackmail that the real eager witness had a chance to talk. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Eager Witness. Division 88 of the Superior Court of the State of California and for the County of Los Angeles now in session. The Honorable Albert Winston, judge presiding. Everybody rise. It was the case of the people versus the oft-arrested, never-convicted, smooth Earl Jernigan, sometimes bookie, charged in the first degree with a month-old killing of a kindly, gray-haired horse trainer named Kurt Hopper, who had once almost been my client. It was the afternoon of the fourth day of the trial, and the prosecutor for the state had already built an almost airtight case against the alleged gambler when my turn finally came. To further substantiate the state's claim... That Earl Jernigan did willfully and with malice aforethought take the life of the deceased Kurt Harper. <laughs> Will Mr. Philip Marlowe take the stand? <laughs> Raise your right hand. <laughs> Promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you, God. I do. State your name and occupation. Philip Marlowe, private detective. Take a stand. Mr. Marlowe, on the morning of the 30th day of July last, the day on which the late Kurt Harper was murdered, were you hired as a private detective by the said Mr. Harper? I was. And at that time, Mr. Marlowe, did Mr. Harper state his reason for hiring you? He did. He wanted me to act as his personal bodyguard on the following day when he planned to drive to San Francisco. Did he say why he needed a personal bodyguard? He did. He told me he was uh, afraid for his life, that he refused the gambler's demand that he drug a certain racehorse a week earlier, that that gambler had threatened to kill him. I see. Now, Mr. Marlowe, did Mr. Harper name that gambler? Yes, he did. Who was it? Earl Jernigan. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Counsel for the defense. Counsel for the defense waves cross-examination, Your Honor. The witness is excused didn't make sense. No cross-examination. Because from the opening adjective, the counsel for the defense, a dapper item named Calder, who always appeared in French cuffs, gray gabardine, and a cocky, uninviting smile, had raved, ranted, and practically spit at each witness the state had presented. So the courtroom was left with a tingling impression that Earl Jernigan's attorney had something of a surprise waiting up his legal sleeve. Later, when Calder was on his feet and addressing the jury, that something started out fast. Now that the state has taken the trouble to offer so much circumstantial evidence, so much hearsay, rumor, conjecture, 
Now will I smash all of that with the testimony of one man. One man known to all of you as an outstanding citizen of this city. A prominent real estate broker. An unimpeachable witness eager to testify. Mr. Leonard Gaines. It worked. Landed in each and every lap like a live grenade and exploded all the way around at once. And when the eminent Mr. Gaines, gray at the temples, maybe 45, a neat and expensive midnight blue flannel with giant stick pin to match, took the stand. And in his own meeting of the board, tone of voice told the court that Earl Jernigan had spent the entire day and night of July 30th last with him at his Malibu Beach home. The prosecuting attorney's jaw dropped to his chest and he stared dumb. day or night did Mr. Jernigan ever leave my home. And as for the hour of the murder, 8 o'clock in the evening, we were having dinner. After that, we played gin rummy until, oh, until midnight. Are you sure of that, Mr. Gaines? The hour of your dinner, I mean. I am positive, Mr. Calder. No, you can't oh. be. You're lying. Order, order. order. Miss Harper, order in the court, please. No, I won't be quiet. I won't anymore. Miss Harper, quiet. Order, order. This court is adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Another scotch and soda, mister? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, wait a minute, baby. I think I'm going to have company. Mr. Morrow, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm... Gail Harper, yeah, I know. (laughs) What I don't know is why you're not doing 30 days on a rock pile with that rumpus you just kicked up in court. Would you like a soft drink? No, thanks. All right, just one, baby. Check. The judge said he understood and left me off with a short lecture, which was what I had counted on. Oh. You mean all that fireworks in there was planned, not just spontaneous combustion? That's right. I had a half time. <laughs> look, Mr. Marlowe, will you work for me? Oh, well, now, look, will baby... Will you help I... me prove that Mr. Leonard Gaines is a liar and that Earl Jernigan did kill my father? Now, take it easy, Gail. It's a big mouthful, you know. Mr. I... Marlowe, listen, please. There isn't much time. We've got to prove this tonight or never. By noon tomorrow with the outside, the case will go to the jury. Okay, what do you want me to do? Take over where I left off. But first, let's get out of here. All right. And never mind that drink, miss. Where do we start, honey? With Leonard Gaines' ex-wife, Debbie Jansen. Here's a snapshot of her. Mmm. They were divorced about six months ago, Mr. Marlowe, and she wasn't very happy about it. No, huh? Made you figure she was your in? Yes, and I was right. Mr. Marlowe, it took eavesdropping, bribery, second story work, but I found out plenty. I'll bet you did. Like what? Oh, hold it, Gail. Light's red. Like the fact that Debbie and a guy called Eugene Mowry are putting a bite on Gaines for $20,000. Mm. Blackmail, Mr. Marlowe, with the payoff schedule to be made sometime tonight. Right now, she's staying at the Sunland Sulphur Springs Lodge out in the valley. Gaines used to go there once in a while for his arthritis. And the why of the whole business is a letter Gaines once wrote to his ex-wife. No fooling. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, tell me, what's that to do with Jernigan's trial and Gaines being a... Oh, it's green now. I think there's a connection, because yesterday I overheard Debbie tell this Maui something about Gaines' scheduled appearance at the trial today, and... Uh-huh. <gasps> oh, Mr. Hey, hey, hey! Those jerk California drivers... The man behind the wheel. What about him? That thin face, blonde hair. I've seen him before. I know he was trying to hit one of us. Oh, fine. Well, that'll keep things from getting dull, won't it? Then, then you're gonna help me. Well, now, look, I... <laughs> uh, who could resist you, baby? Okay, tonight I check in at the lodge at Sunland Sulphur Springs. Come on, let's get out of here. It was 8 o'clock and almost dark when I reached the foothills of the mountain range that separates the San Fernando Valley from L.A. proper and turned off onto a narrow dirt road that ran through a twisting gorge past a moon-faced watchman who asked no questions as he slowly opened a sagging wooden gate faintly labeled Sunland Sulphur Springs where Mother Nature's remedies bubbled from the earth private. (laughs) It was another five minutes along the same dirt road uphill and through thick foliage before I was at a parking space out of my car and walking the last quarter of a mile toward the lodge itself that was spotted with widely separated cottages also sagging. And each tag casa, and followed by something Spanish and hard to pronounce. Inside the place was cheap porch furniture and occasional threadbare rugs over scarred pine and deserted, except for a sleepy old guy with thick-lidded eyes and an accordion wrinkled face who was slouched in a heap behind a sign on the reservation desk. The red Maynard Sharp, no less, night manager. When I gave him my name and said that both my rheumatism and I needed a rest, he came too, almost. Oh, 
Uh, Rumi, Mr. Marlowe. Well, let's see. Can let you have most any one of the cottages. Half of them are empty. Things kind of slow this time of year. How slow can you get? You'd be surprised. Uh, how's about uh, Casa Francisco de Leon? Casa Francisco, hmm? Yeah, that'll be fine, Mr. Sharp. All righty, sir. Now, if you'll just sign the register here, I'll get your key. But uh, you As have I to signed my name, I checked the shop. guest list quickly. And the next second found what I wanted. Deborah Jansen. And next to that, and in a different hand, her cottage for the night. Uh, Casa Rolando de uh, Baron Dido. That's close enough. Well, anyway, it was all I needed. I took the key from Mr. Sharp, a misnomer if ever you heard one. Learned the location of my quarters, paid him in advance, and left. Thanks, sir. Outside, I turned to my right, past a large open bath that smelled like rotten eggs and talked to itself like a junior Vesuvius, as more warm sulfur waters equally unpleasant to smell bubbled from a pipe in the center. Beyond that was the first cottage, another casa I couldn't pronounce, and it stayed like that all the way down the line until I reached the second one that showed light. It was the casa known as Rolando de Barandido. And when I moved closer and around to a window that was screen only, I knew that my client had done her eavesdropping well, because in the center of the room and putting on her coat was the ex-wife named Debbie, and standing nearby and holding on tight to the cigarette in his hand like it was support. Debbie, what had Maury. to be the boyfriend, sure Eugene you know Maury. You're, you're, you're sure that Gaines will go through with this all right? For the hundredth time, Eugene, yes, I'm positive. Can't you understand? He has to. Besides, $20,000 won't break him. It won't more than bend him a bit. Now, stop worrying. But I can't. Debbie, wh- why must you go alone? Now, why can't I go with you? Eugene, please, we've been over that. I told Leonard that I'd meet him in town at the Beverly Crest Hotel at 10 and alone. He agreed to also be alone. Except for the month. Debbie, you do handle things well. Come here, darling. The kiss for your brilliant. Oh, please, Eugene, there isn't time. Oh, what's the matter? Are my kisses losing their flavor at this point? Don't be a fool. Look, it's late, Eugene. It's after nine already. I've got to hurry. Now, go on. Go on, be a good boy and leave now. We shouldn't even be seen together tonight. Well, why not, Debbie? It's not smart. Meet me at the tulip room, darling, at 11, as we planned. Then, Eugene, we'll have time and reason to relax. 20,000 bucks worth of reason. As Maori oozed toward the door, I slid away from the cottage and into the shadow of a clump of trees nearby. Stayed there as he walked out of sight down the road that led back to the parking space. Then a few minutes later, when Debbie clicked off the light and left, I moved out of hiding and started slowly after her at a safe distance. Until from some place in the night, an ugly, snub-nosed automatic that belonged to someone blonde and thin-faced as a near-automobile accident stopped me cold. Where are you going, Jack? For air. I love to walk in the country at night, okay? I wouldn't know, Jack. I'm a city boy myself. But as long as that's what you want, it's Jake with me. As long as it's where it's good and dark. Now, go on. That way. Move. All right, Jack. That's far enough. Hold it. Turn around and face me. Why? So I can watch you pull the trigger? Never mind why. Just turn. Okay, turn it is. That's better. Now, one step closer. One step closer. Hey, what's that? Now, pleasant, my friend, taking wing. <laughs> now, before I beat you into little pieces, let's have it. Who are you? Who do you work for, and what do you want with me? Come on, gunman, talk. Okay. Okay, uh, no more. My name's Langley. Work for Earl Jernigan. Oh? Uh, yeah, I've been watching you ever since the trial started. Jernigan didn't want you moving in on Which is why you tried to pick me off with a car when I was with Gail Harper this afternoon, huh? Come on! Yeah, 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 yeah that's why, now... Now, what are you going to do with me? For the time being, Buster Levy as is. Flat on your back, because I've still got to catch up with a lady before she reads a letter. City boy. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... 
Because of the sharp rise in America's birth rate during the war, we face a very serious educational crisis. Many communities will find that their schools lack sufficient teachers, classrooms, and facilities. Citizens must get together and work for better schools, more teachers. If we want all of our children to have a chance for a good education, we must take action now. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Eager Witness. It was strictly hit and run. I piled Langley into the Manzanita and didn't even wait to see him bounce. Instead, I took off through a gully that was a shortcut to my car. Because I knew that Jernigan's watchdog had nothing to offer compared with a hot-headed Debbie Jansen, who at the moment, no doubt, was well on her way to the Beverly Crest Hotel and the blackmail rendezvous that was a cinch to wind up in the final destruction of the letter. That was my theory. But I dropped it like a hot rock just as I crossed the path to the sulfur pool. Mr. Marlowe! Mr. Marlowe! Somebody screamed! Yeah, in there by the spring! Oh, my gosh! Oh, my gosh. Sure, to it was nothing but sulfur fumes and the thick gurgle of the springs until Sharp played his flashlight over the pool. Then we saw. Oh, my gosh. And the water that was turning red from blood oozing around the knife in her look, back. Look, look. It's Miss Jansen. Come on, Pop. Give me a hand. Let's yeah. get her out of there. Yeah, I... Come on. <clears throat> Take it easy now. Take it easy. <clears throat> That's it. Debbie. I never should have tried it. Tried what, Debbie? Who was it, Debbie? Who did this? He, he, he got the letter. Who? Who got the letter, Debbie? Debbie. Marlo, did she, did she pass out? For good, Maynard. She's dead. Oh, uh, she, she seemed to be mumbling something about a letter. Did you get what it was? The only part of it. The killer apparently took the letter away from her. Believe me, that's bad. What's a letter? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? Oh, it's probably that pheasant again. Letters? What are you talking about, Oh, son? I guess I'm just getting jumpy. Hey. Hey, there is somebody. Come on, Pop. Sounds, sounds like he's over there, Marlo. Yeah, I can hear him. Oh, no, that, that ain't going to do you any good, son. Not in that brush, it ain't. And what's more, I wouldn't go any further if I was you. But, Pop, all he needs is ten seconds and he can destroy that letter for good. Well, just the same, there's a million and one places a killer can hide in there and lay for you, son. Yeah. Yeah, Pop, well, for the moment it's a stalemate. I'd sure love to find out who that snake in the bush is. You know... I've run a peaceful place up until it's getting to be like one of them there movies. <laughs> Only thing left out is a posse. Yeah, you're so right. Murders in the night, lost letters. It's corny enough without a posse. Yeah, and uh, my dangers, too. Hmm? Yeah, I see what you mean. Are you ready to... Uh, to... Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, I'll lead you back to the office. My Jasper, I don't understand this one bit. Miss Jensen is stabbed to death over that letter, and in her dying... Hey. Ma- huh? What is it? Shh. Up ahead there. What? Somebody duck behind that big tree. Keep the chatter going, man. Walk what? on up the path. Don't let him know we spotted him. Go on, talk, talk. Oh, well, I, uh, okay, sure, sure. I was saying, I don't understand. Well, our place here is generally as quiet as a tomb. As the old now, man grimly had led his way up the path, I followed a few feet behind. When he could even with the tree, I turned suddenly, took three fast steps, and grabbed it. Come here, you. Hang on to you. Well, well. Mr. Leonard Gaines, the unimpeachable citizen himself, stand still, Gaines. Uh, uh, a gun. What's the idea, Marlowe? Try running and it'll come to you. I suppose you've got a legitimate reason for being here all thought up? I, I'm here because I, I've got a touch of arthritis. I need a treatment and a night's rest. Arthritis isn't all you're going to have if I find what I think I'm going to find in your pockets. Empty him, Buster. I'll I said empty him. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll empty them. That's better. A sharp, you're a witness, and I demand that you now, stop... Now, uh, just a minute, Mr. Gaines. You're in a pretty bad spot to demand anything. There, there's our baby. There's a letter we've been looking for. Pick it up, Gaines. Pick it up and read it. Now, now see here, Marlowe. See there, Gaines. Read it while you're able to. Yeah. My dear Debbie, 
If I didn't know you so well, I'd resent your stupid accusations. Now, look, Mark. Read it. We've already made our property settlement, as you're well aware, and you'll be a long time finding a court that says otherwise. Now you know where you can go, so why not get started as ever, Leonard? Oh, fine. That's as about as incriminating as a lecture on the family meat bill. Sharp, whose jurisdiction are we under here? Uh, Juris, uh, why, uh, county sheriff's office. All right, call him. Also, call your man out on the highway and have him lock that main gate. Main gate? Yeah. Say, now, that's a good idea. I'll do it right now. Now, wait a minute. Have you got a gun? Yep, got a rifle. Been in the family for years. Can you use it? Well, uh, yeah, I reckon I can. uh, Where are you going? Out the roundup Langley. He'll be pushing hard to give his boss a star witness here a big helping hand. I want to be in shape to push back. And remember, Pop, Uh, keep your eye on Gaines and not on the phone when you make those calls. I'll see you. The second time that night, I started down the hill and toward the car lot, keeping in the shadows and moving slowly this time. Because it was odds on that Langley had taken everything in. And I knew that he'd try to part my hair with a gun barrel and pull Leonard Gaines out of the jam he was in the very first chance he had. So I stayed off the paths long enough to have both socks full of burrs when it happened. But not what I expected. It was the shop family blunderbust that had exploded with a blast like a small howitzer. So also for the second time, I turned and ran back up the hill, this time to the office. I got there just as Maynard climbing hand over hand up a smoking rifle barrel made it to his feet. Maynard! Maynard, what happened? Where's Gaines? Well, I, I, I don't know. It got away, I guess. Well, the shot. What about that? It went up there through the roof. Oh, fine. Well, gosh, I, I, I didn't suspect a thing. He just said he wanted to smoke. But he didn't happen to have a match, I know. So you hung your rifle over your arm, stuck both hands in your pockets to find one for him, and that's when he took you. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Well, how'd you know? Never mind, Pop. Well, I, I, I made a grab for him, though. Uh, ripped his coat about halfway off. Oh, that's great. That's uh, great. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm sure sorry he got away, Mark. All right, don't worry about it, will you? Can't get far with the gate locked. Well, I, uh, I got bad news there, too. Oh, oh, the gate's locked all right. But uh, there's a back road. There's a back what? Back road. Rod, yeah, well, uh, right, yeah, well, right. It ain't ain't much. It's uh, rough and rocky, but it's passable. And uh, anybody's been up here as often as Mr. Gaines has, is sure to know about it. Oh, great. Look, Pop, can't you understand that there was a murder committed here tonight and we had the murder yeah, and but no my... buts? <sighs> Fell for the oldest gag in the world. But I was Marlo... a sucker to turn him over to you. And will you stop waving that envelope? I just think you ought to see this. All right, what is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Where'd you get all that loot? Gaines dropped it when I ripped his coat. Twenty grand, it says here on the wrapper. Something else written here, too. Casa Rolando de Barandito at ten. Casa Ron... Pop, that's it. That's the answer. Come on, we got to get down that back road in a hurry. Sharp at the wheel of the pickup truck, we bounced over the pair of sometimes parallel ruts studded with stones the size of bowling balls. It was called a back road. The better part of two miles before he cut lights and motor and whispered that if Gaines was going to get stuck at all, it was sure to happen in a dry wash just around the next bend. I told him to wait and went ahead on foot. He was right. Gaines was stuck in more ways than one. His car was up to its hubcaps in sand and his wallet up to its stamp compartment in blackmail, conducted by his ex-wife's murderer with the same leather she'd had, the letter. It was Eugene Murray, and clenched in his hand was a tattered white envelope, nothing more. I'll make it easy for you. I held my 38 in close my to my side and edged up behind them. 20,000. Now, Murray, uh, I don't have that much. You lie. You're going to pay her that. I don't know. I know because we, we, we worked the deal out together. Only she got greedy. She tried to double-cross me and pull it alone. Oh, so you killed her? Yes, I, I didn't intend to, but when I found out that she tricked me, I, I was furious. <laughs> First thing that I knew, I, I, I'd stabbed her. Uh, that's enough of that. Just give me the money. You have nothing to worry about. Now, listen, Maori, I no, tell you, I... you listen, Gabe. You're in no position to buy it. It's better than having your $200,000 gambling debt exposed and your reputation ruined, isn't it? <laughs> or facing the trigger man, Langley, if you refuse the alibi for Jernigan, isn't it? Or bucking a perjury charge if you do alibi? Oh, no, no, no. You've got yourself in the corner, again. So pay off. Only 20 grand. But I tell you, Maori, I don't have it. You're lying simply... again. No, he isn't. Hold don't hold move. On. I don't want to be. Leave your hands where they are. I got the 20 grand right here, and it's pretty well earmarked as blackmail payment already. 
But just to round things out, Maury, I'll take that envelope you've got there. This? Well, what do you want this for? Funny man. Because it's no doubt postmarked with an hour, a date, and a location. Which, together with Brother Gaines' own handwriting, places him out of town on July 30th. A time he swears he was at his Malibu home all day with Jernigan. Right, Gaines? Uh, smart boy, aren't you, Marlowe? You've still got a chance, Gaines. You'd better gamble with me. You've got nothing to lose now. I'm with you. Stand still, Buster. Or, sir, help me out. Now, Gaines, go! Go! Oh, my leg! Were you thinking of going someplace, Mr. Gaines? Uh, no. No, I... I'm not going anyplace, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Well, Gail, the big show's about to start. Court will be in session in a few minutes. I know. And different from yesterday. Yeah. Oh, you did a swell job, Mr. Marlowe. Gee, gee, I don't know how to thank you. Save it, baby. If that scale Lady Justice holds in her hands is in better balance today, it was your hunch and old Maynard's blunderbuss did as much to put it there as my running around through the brush at Sulphur Springs. But all I knew was that game was lying. <clears throat> I didn't know it was as complicated as it was. Well, that's because Debbie Jansen was twice as treacherous as we figured. I still don't understand. How did you know that Eugene Maury had killed Debbie? Well, you see, baby, I overheard her tell Maury that she was going to meet Gaines in the Beverly Crest Hotel at 10 for the payoff. Uh-huh. But I figured that was a lie strictly for Maury's benefit when Pop gave me the packet of money Gaines had dropped. It had that complicated name of a cabin in the time of the appointment, which was also 10, written on it. Mm. So I knew the real meeting was scheduled to take place out there. See? Oh, I see. Then she was going to send Maury off to the Beverly Crest while she collected the money at Sulphur Springs and then beat it alone. That's it, honey. You see, if her cabin had been named something simple like uh, Number Four, then Gaines could have remembered it. Instead of that Casa Robino del Bangadoro, or <laughs> whatever it was, he had to write down, you see? Well, then things might have been different. Ah, oh, you'd have found a way. After all, you figured out it was the postmark that was important. Only after I'd been slapped in the face by a perfectly harmless letter with no envelope. Had to be the postmark. What else? Oh, they're starting. Yeah. Good luck, Mr. Marlowe. Give them the works. Don't worry, baby. I'm the eager witness today. We're going to knock them dead. Literally. <laughs> they got it coming. I watched Jernigan's face as the preliminaries got underway. The killer was beaten. When the court finally settled down to work and the prosecutor took over, I listened to his deft build-up as he primed the jury and the dramatic ringmaster voice he used when he called... Will Philip Marlowe take the stand, please? Now, Mr. Marlowe, you told us yesterday that you are a private investigator. Now will you tell the court in your own words... What happened to you last night? I sat there looking into the cold, baleful eyes of the prosecutor and thought of a paraphrase on that wonderful quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes. It's not enough to ask for justice. One must also hope for mercy. Mr. Marlowe. Hmm? Oh, oh yes, I I'm sorry. Well, it began here in this room yesterday afternoon at about 3.30 when the counsel for defense called a witness, a Mr. Leonard Gaines, to the stand. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy... Star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonnell. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joy Terry, John Daner, Michael Ann Barrett, Junius Matthews, Ben Wright, Lou Krugman, Larry Dobkin, and Bud Widom. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... The trail started in Montana with a bum with two names rushing away from his lady love and led fast into L.A. past a southerner from Canada, a worried wool dealer and a chorus girl with a forty-five. When it finally stopped at murder in the park, the tramp was still in a hurry. <laughs> You 
and I have a friend coming to call next Monday night. She's my friend Irma. If this beautiful, lovable, but dumb blonde isn't your friend now, she will be the moment you hear her over most of these same CBS network stations next Monday following the Lux Radio Theater. My friend Irma will bring you plenty of laughs and great entertainment. So be sure to make friends with my friend Irma these Monday nights on CBS, where you'll hear them all this fall. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Arthur Godfrey's talent scouts are heard Mondays, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. I like that episode. A really nice setup in terms of the stakes and the mystery that needed solved, and also a pretty satisfying conclusion. The only thing I didn't get was the last line when he remembered the Oliver Wendell Holmes quote about mercy. Because I can't figure out why he was thinking about that. Usually at the end when they throw in those uh, little quotes, they kind of make sense in the context of the episode. But that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Nick Carter. And next Wednesday, another episode of Philip Marlowe. In the meantime, become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. We now have nearly 4,000 uh, friends, and I would love you to join the list.